in a country of 12 million people. Over 11 million parcels of land registered. And out of the 11 million parcels registered, over 7 million titles have been issued. On the African continent, possibly is unheard of. Land reform matters because it presents a huge opportunity for city and country's development as a whole. On the demand side, people want to feel that they can do long-term investment because their land rights are protected. On the supply side, government also wants to ensure that people have confidence in its own land administration system. Government also needs to make sure that they can get land-based tax revenues, which will then eventually be reinvested in various socio-economic development infrastructure. Land reform in Rwanda was introduced in a series of interventions. Phase one is in the aftermath of the genocide against the Tutsi. There were a number of interventions, which in many cases were interim measures to make sure at least priority issues are addressed. Phase two was more of a development phase. Where are we taking this sector? Rwanda developed what is known as Vision 2020, which basically describes where Rwanda and Rwandans wanted to be in the year 2020. And land reform was identified as one of the key pillars of that reform. So there was a series of consultations that took place, which ended with the passing of the national land policy in 2004. 2005, the organic land law. 2006, we started the public consultations. The consultations took place in four distinctive regions of the country involved over 20 groups of land users. Because we need to understand exactly what's the reality on the ground and what people's perceptions are and what are the potential issues. From 2007, then we did the pilot land registration exercise. Now we are working out technically what's the best approach. Then 2009, we came up with a roadmap. This was a successful pilot exercise. Now we understand the methodology that can work we can now embark on the rollout of the reform. And the roadmap was very specific. These are the resources required. These are the steps-by-step -step processes we have to go through. By June 2012, what we call demarcation and adjudication exercise had ended. This is basically recording all the boundaries on the maps and recording claimants' rights in the register book. That exercise had ended, but obviously, title issuance is a continuous process. Even now, people are still getting land titles as the process moves. In a country where less than 1% of land was estimated to be in the register, changing people's mindset was one, one challenge. We didn't have an example of a country that had gone through a similar exercise and succeed. The satellite imagery that was used didn't have really good resolution. So we, used, we went to use on um, aerial photography, but then the resolution in some parts of the country was not really that clear. How do you register a land that is owned by a polygamous family? The man has two or three wives and none of them is legally married to him. There are specific issues to urban areas. One is the density of houses, especially in informal settlements. I would never really use the word slum. They, they are informal because of the happy a hazard way of development. Some of these informal settlements are viable areas. You know, you have access to electricity, road connection is not terrible. Based on the technique that was being used, which is general boundary principles, you come, I ask you, show me your boundaries. I draw the boundaries on the, on the sheet, field sheet I had, and this had to be approved by your neighbors, whether they agree on the boundaries or not. But for cases of you know, density, this was, this was an issue. Uh, second, there was an issue of absentee landowners. In urban areas, everybody is really busy with their jobs. There was nobody to give the information. Uh, in, in that case, the majority of land uh, registration took place during the weekends when people were, were back in their homes. The technique we were using was a paper-based system. So when you're collecting this information, demarcating parcel boundaries on the image, recording with, you know, in books. The margin of errors could be very high when you have to take paper-based system, entering them into a, a knee-based system. There is probability that you'd really face a lot of challenges, maybe how names of people were really spelled, ID numbers were wrongly spelled. So those are some of the challenges. 
one of the reforms that was introduced was actually to review the land law, to make sure that where the law was silent, the law was reformed and provide clarity, provided clarity on how islands should be registered. Second reform was the registration of grouped settlement. Initially, grouped settlement in some areas were built by government to resettle people, internally displaced people, or even returning refugees. So they were resettled on government land. But during the registration, it wasn't clear. Do we register individual houses, individual plots, to families who were living there, or do we register the entire village? Then this is another area that triggered change in the legislation because government was to sit and review uh, the law based on what we had uh, encountered on the field. The biggest achievement since the reform was introduced is the registration of every single piece of land in Rwanda. I think this year the World Bank report on doing business ranks Rwanda second in the world in the registering property. This has allowed a number of things to happen. On the demand side, you have people having legal documents showing their land rights and their obligations and the obligation of the state on a single piece of land. It's a portal, an online portal. You put in your parcel and you get information of what your land is designated for in terms of, of planning. If you feel uh, that your land rights are fully protected, it's an incentive for you to invest in urban areas. But also it's a good opportunity for the banking sector to, to provide mortgage because security of tenure is guaranteed and therefore urban infrastructure development benefits from that. On the supply side, on the other hand, the systematic land registration has generated a number of opportunities. Obviously, when you know who owns what, what types of rights every city dwellers have, in case of urban expansion, in case of developing new urban infrastructure, it's easier for city authority actually to plan accordingly. In some districts of Kigali City, their land-based revenues have increased five-fold as a result of this land registration exercise. That has a huge impact on infrastructure development. If their revenue increases, they're able to give back. It's about actioning some of the policies, making sure legislation are in place, making sure uh, uh, institutions framework required to support the land reform is in place. And at the same time, for the case of Rwanda, I would say, is actually to ensure that government can also borrow lessons, is willing to take lessons from different experts. The homogeneous nature and character of Rwanda as a country and its size were also key contributing factors. You know, Rwanda is only 26,000 kilometers, square kilometers. Rwandans speak the same language. Also because there are only two land tenure regime. It's either you own land on leasehold or freehold. That also contributed to the success of the program. You don't know exactly how it's going to turn out if you roll out straight away. But if you embark on piloting the exercise, through the pilot you learn good lessons that can inform strategic decision making that would definitely be useful in the rollout. Land reform is achievable and doable. Not only are generating revenues to support agriculture, to support urban development, but also it affects people's livelihood, which then contributes into the wider economic development program. It's just not right to do it because another country did it. It's to do it because you're responding to specific issues, but also because you're unlocking specific opportunities. Mm -hmm.